Many thanks, Joe. It's now my great pleasure to introduce um, our next invited speaker, who is Dr. Ruth Hussey, who's the CMO for Wales. And in her job, what she does is provides independent professional advice to the First Minister and the Cabinet and to Welsh government officials on health and healthcare matters. But it's a very extensive role that you have, Ruth, because you've got a lot of aspects of your job that you have to do in leading public health policy all over Wales, leading the clinical contribution of Wales to improving quality of healthcare and patient outcomes, and leading the medical profession as well and the regulatory aspects of the medical profession. And Ruth has been a great friend to us in Bangor University and across this collaboration between Bangor and Betsy Cadwallader, and we're very grateful to have you here with us today. Thank you. Well, bore dar pawb. Uh, Dwi'n falch iawn i fod yma. Uh, gael siawns i siarad gyda chi heddiw. Um, well, good morning, everyone. And um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here to have a chance to, to talk today. Um, I'm going to take the conversation in a, a slightly broader way to put a, a context on why all this matters uh, to us as people and citizens here in, in Wales. And um, I was sitting there thinking about, you know, being back in Bangor. And I'll, I'll just tell you that um, it's 60 years ago since um, I was grateful to the maternity unit in Bangor for safely bringing me into this world. So thank you to Bangor. <laughs> um, uh, but I was also thinking that, um, and I'm told, that my mother had a, a lying-in period in the unit of three weeks. <laughs> now, I was the third child, so there may have been a reason for why she needed three weeks. Um, but uh, contrast that with uh, the birth of, of my daughter, um, 25 years ago now, uh, when I was home within eight hours uh, and I couldn't get home fast enough. So, um, you know, the, uh, the importance of context, the importance of science and knowledge uh, really matters in daily practice uh, for us as professionals. And uh, I think this is a great opportunity to just reflect on uh, the things as we look forward now uh, that we really should be focusing on. And uh, I'll do a little bit of um, backwards and forwards uh, thinking. So let's see. So I want to talk a bit about uh, the health, where we are, but also what we need to be thinking about for the future. So, progress and opportunities. Um, you know, what do we do? There's so many things going on. How do we prioritise what we look at? Um, what do we learn from the past, uh, I think, is a key challenge for me. And really being conscious of where we've come from and where we're going. Um, we are the Wi-Fi generation. Um, I was driving down this morning and um, listening to the uh, report about access to Wi-Fi and the frustration amongst the public about why their Wi-Fi wasn't, I can't even remember, 100-something bits per millisecond or something. Um, but we are so familiar with it now. How different? Uh, and one of the things they were using to illustrate it was um, young people travelling abroad now uh, who um, check into home every day or every other day. Whereas I remember going off for three months and sending one postcard. So, you know, lives have changed immensely. So health is changing. And we've got to be ahead of that and, and think about the things that matter as the cohorts of us move through that generational cycle. But just to reflect back a little bit, I'll take you through this picture. I'm going to talk briefly about the five waves of public health. Um, what, what's been driving the science and technology of medicine uh, over the 150 years plus now. So let's start with the person on the left, um, the first medical officer of health um, in uh, the UK, uh, down the road in Liverpool, Dr Duncan. They actually have a pub named after him, but let's not go there. Um, and, you know, the issues of the day <coughs> were sanitation, cholera, uh, housing conditions, but they did the right thing. They whitewashed the houses. They put the drains in with Thomas Fresh, the inspector of nuisances. They worked closely together. Um, but what they thought was that the, the illness was spread by the air, that it was miasma. And it was years later before we knew about the germ uh, theory and actually what was happening. So, so luckily, they did the right things. Um, but it was so important. And the, the second wave was very much... Uh, the uh, vaccination era, the science era, the understanding. Very much still, though, infection was the order of the day. Um, those were the big issues, the big um, challenges to mortality in society for many decades after that. What was the third wave? Well, the third wave, I think, was the welfare state, wasn't it? The realisation uh, started to emerge that once we started to deal with infection, there were other factors in society that were driving poor health. Um, we saw children in school malnourished. 
uh, we saw policies emerging and of course we saw the development of the National Health Service and the medicalisation uh, of some aspects of our health, uh, developing the science around that. And then in about the 50s onwards, the science took us to chronic diseases, uh, we, whilst infection and each of these, if you like, waves of public health practice are still pertinent today. Headlines only this week, different infections emerging, new infections, antibiotic resistance. So none of that's gone away. Um, but we also have layers of complexity building up about the other factors that are playing out. So now we entered the fourth wave of public health, which is chronic diseases, our lifestyle choices, driven by all sorts of factors. And, um, you know, the first research was actually on doctors and their smoking habits, which eventually led to 50 years of knowledge about how smoking was harming our health and kills one in two people uh, who use, use that product. So massive shift in our understanding and chronic diseases now is one of the major issues facing us globally. Um, but the fifth wave is emerging and has been emerging now um, for some years. And people talk about it um, as the well-being shift. Um, there's an also an undercurrent, which I'm going to uh, illustrate in a minute, which is that health is not fairly distributed across society. So let's talk a bit about that. How are we doing? Well, healthy life expectancy, not just overall survival, but um, being in good health for as long as possible, we just about get to our pension age. Um, but as we get um, uh, um, older in, in the workplace uh, and as the pension age increases, the reality is many people in work will be working with chronic illnesses, sometimes multiple illnesses. So there are implications for how we work as a health system and others in that context. Uh, so we, we get past our 60th birthday, thankfully, um, uh, generally on average into our 60s in good health. Um, there's a difference slightly between men and women, and that gap's been changing. Uh, men have uh, improved some of, of that. So what's going on there? What, what do we need to do? Well, um, I think we need to look at the gap between being in good health um, and the gap with how long we spend in poor health uh, before we eventually succumb. And they call it the compression of morbidity, narrowing the period when we have multiple illnesses uh, before succumbing to those illnesses. Um, the other issue, and this is overall life expectancy, is this uneven distribution uh, from rich to poor. It's not, you know, poor people have a worse outcome than rich people. It's a continuum. It should matter to all of us the underpinning issues that are driving that, that distribution of uh, limited life. So how have things been changing? Well, these are just numbers that I've looked at a 10-year period and just the, what are the types of things that have been driving that pattern of, of, of poor outcome? And um, the improvements have come from a massive shift in the disease patterns around heart disease. Now, we could speculate why. Um, smoking must have been a key factor, and the patterns have changed immensely over the last decades. Um, and other treatments have come in. Uh, what we also see is emerging patterns in other illnesses. I won't go through all of them. Um, but my point is, we need to look at that and understand um, each co age cohort that goes through is experiencing a different pattern of health. So what our children will, the pattern our children will have will be very different to the one to, uh, of our parents and, and my generation going through. So really understanding that life course and, and the way it works is part of our research agenda. Um, so I said, um, there's a social gradient also, not just in mortality, but in living with poor health. Um, again, are our services designed in such a way to match services to needs? Or do we uh, offer a, a pattern on who, who turns up? Are we actively understanding what we as a health system need to do to respond to that pattern of poor health? And as I said, ill health is common. Um, uh, many people have multiple ill health. I won't go through all the statistics here, um, but just from our own Welsh Health Survey, you'll see high levels of blood pressure problems, respiratory, mental illness, slowly creeping up in society. Each year, we see a very small, steady trend. Now, is that because we have campaigns to stop the stigma attached to mental health? Or is it because, actually, there's a changing pattern going on in society that we need to be aware of? So lots to understand and get behind. And we know with diabetes is also steadily increasing, uh, driven by the uh, obesity um, uh, problem that we face. 
Um, but harmful behaviours remain uh, the dominant feature as well. So this is a, uh, looking at the five healthy lifestyles. I won't test you to um, find out how many you do. Um, but if we look at them as the five, what proportion of, of our society actually follows all five? Not smoking, drinking within the new guidelines. I hope you've seen them. Um, physical activity, body, healthy body weight and a good diet. How many people do that? And uh, what we see... Uh, is a normal distribution. So the challenge is, we know from our own long-term research, the Kai Philly study, the cohort study over 30 years, if you're on the right-hand side of this, you can prevent diabetes, dementia, and other illnesses. Um, you can have longevity, healthy longevity. Um, what our challenge is, to, can we push people to do more? Uh, each bit you move along that continuum, you have benefit. So, and obviously, some of them, like smoking, are are significantly important within that, but the others too. So again, what do we know from the research uh, that helps us think about the psychology, the behaviour change, I know, uh, think about children's behaviour change, all things that you'll be interested in. But let's take a step back. You know, is this all about the medical profession, health professionals, uh, looking at research questions, or is, is there a wider underpinning question for everybody interested in research here today in Bangor? And the answer is yes. We know, and this is now about 20 years old, Margaret Whitehead uh, recently awarded a damehood based at Liverpool University. The work she's done over the years to look at the underlying factors that drive health outcomes in our society. The vast majority of our health outcome is not delivered by the health service. The vast majority is from the living and social conditions of our lives and the choices we make. So again, how do we bring the research into that to understand? And of course, Michael Marmot has spent many years now producing global reports, UK reports, um, European reports about that inequality pattern of what we need to focus on to change people's life chances um, and reduce that injustice of having unequal uh, opportunity for good health. So I mentioned the fifth wave of uh, thinking. And um, the challenge for us now is to start thinking about how do we create a well society? How do we not just focus on people who are ill, but think about creating that wellness in society. Um, and I think, I have to say, working in Wales, well-being is completely uh, understood uh, in the psyche of what we talk about. It's an open door to start thinking through what are the policies and practices that create good health uh, in uh, everything that we do. Um, and uh, in April, we see the publication of the well-being, or sorry, the enactment of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Uh, significantly changing the conversation about thinking long term, uh, thinking about how we work to create those uh, conditions for good health. And I'm delighted that, you know, a prosperous society, a resilient society, a healthy society is one of those overarching goals. And there's many more bits of legislation creating the conditions for us to enjoy good health. I won't go through them all in the interest of time. But, you know, that's the goal, um, creating the, the, the circumstances where we make the right choices and have the right opportunities. <coughs> What's interesting in the Future Generations Act is the framing of governance for health. It's not governance of the health service or the health system, but how we have a shared governance across all policy areas to make sure that we're driving the right health outcomes for all of us. So um, prevention, fantastic that it's now one of those cross-cutting principles of how we make decisions across the whole public sector. Um, think long-term. Again, um, lots of skills here in Bangor to be able to look at uh, policies and practices and look at long-term benefits, linking data, all sorts of opportunities. I won't go through it all again. Integration. I was delighted um, to hear Joe talk about collaboration. These are the principles of the way forward. Silo working is finished. It doesn't give us what we need, needed. We have to cross over into each other's areas. I did a, 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 an MD some years ago now and on social capital was one element of it and um, came across this lovely quote which has always stayed with me. And it was, um, uh, with social capital, it was an interface of social psychology, sociology, uh, clinicians, a whole range of different disciplines. And um, one uh, academic said, um, I wish people would stop fishing in other people's ponds. <laughs> and I, I say to you, go fishing. Get in there, because you'll, you'll see the world through a different lens. So let's fish together, uh, would be my message there. 
So let's just delve quickly into uh, a couple of areas which are, I think are, are really important for us to think about for the future. So I talked about Michael Marmot's work and many others who um, are quite clear now that we can change children's life chances forever in the first couple of years. So maternal health, first two years of life, are we systematically, universally delivering the right responses? Uh, we know the things that can harm children. Uh, there was a report only recently on adverse childhood experiences and the impact on lifestyles over the long term and people's life chances. So um, we've got lots of research here. How can we really focus on changing children's life chances forever? That is a fundamental to um, what we need to think about. Secondly, um, I know you will have heard about prudent healthcare. Um, only mm, two weeks ago now, um, we published uh, an update, an action plan, looking at um, three big ticket things that we could do to try and shift our thinking about prudent healthcare. Um, doing only what we can do, uh, you know, thinking about equity, thinking about real partnership and power with patients, sharing with patients. And again, I was pleased to see Joe reference that. Um, very soon, the HealthWise Wales research cohort uh, study will be promoted very actively. And that is about a new partnership with the people we serve in Wales, sharing our knowledge together to create wealth and uh, new health knowledge. So real opportunities to rethink what we do around the research agenda. But let me delve into one aspect of how you might apply prudent healthcare thinking uh, to an area that is of interest to all of us, especially me, uh, given my, uh, where I am in the life cycle, and that is older people. And what we know um, is that people over the age of 65 are the main users of the health service. Uh, have we thought through a model that works where we have multiple chronic illnesses uh, needing long-term uh, preventative approaches and um, interactive treatments? Or have we a research agenda which has looked at what's the role of drug X on that illness and drug Y on that illness and, and drug Z on this one? Um, what we now need and what we're faced with is a, an 85-year-old with a bag of 20 medicines What's the interaction here? What, what's the right way forward? And most importantly, what matters to the person? Um, thinking through how we tailor research. On one hand, there'll be a huge growth in personalised medicine. I haven't got time today to go in more into that. But as drugs become more specific and tailored, um, we also need to make sure that people are true partners in making those choices, coming back to that. Um, so, how we support older people, there's a growing understanding that home first is a movement that um, applies to older people in the same way that it applies now to, you know, maternity. You want to be at home. So, how can we build a health system that understands all these complex interactions, but is truly informed by the person using that service? Again, I could dwell at length about it. So, is prudent healthcare making a difference? Um, well, yes. I can point to lots of examples where teams have come together, looked at the evidence base, thought through what they're doing and said, you know what, we can do it differently. Now, I, what I want to see is that systematically built across Wales. There is an agenda to build around prudent healthcare. And if, if um, uh, plagiarism is the highest form of flattery, I was delighted to see that the CMO in Scotland has, uh, in her recent report, coined the phrase realistic medicine and talks about prudent healthcare. Uh, as, um, uh, as something that they've looked at uh, in terms of informing their thinking. Uh, outside of Wales, there's a lot of interest in, in um, less is more, slow medicine, uh, choosing wisely. There's a whole set of initiatives across the globe. We're at the forefront of this. People are looking to us to say, how are you going to take this forward now? So I mentioned that we published, oh, published a report um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I won't go through the detail of this, but the top three uh, things are where we think we can make some significant breakthroughs. So can we drive down unnecessary variation in treatments? What are the behaviours, the systems? You've got knowledge that can help to nudge the right systems into, into practice. How do we do some of that? Secondly, the model of outpatients has been around for 40 years or more. If you've got multiple illnesses, you're 85, you live two hours away in the Clean Peninsula, um, really, coming to a clinic nearly every week, a different clinic for different conditions. So I was delighted to see innovation led by geriatricians in Bangor to say, do you know what? This isn't good value medicine. 
let's think about putting it in a different way. So trying telehealth and different ideas. We've got to try and innovate, putting the patient and the carer in the, in the driving seat of what works for them and, and what matters to them. Um, and then thirdly, um, the, the need to work together. Um, the, our workforce needs to understand how to operate in this complex environment and can we make that simpler. Oh, as I say, I haven't got time to go through it all. Finally, so what are the big grand challenges of the future then? You know, I've talked about where we've come from, the five waves of public health. Where are we heading to? Well, there are some huge things that we need to absorb, adapt, uh, understand the implications, whether it's climate change and the weather patterns that emerge or the change in the uh, insects of the world, uh, where they, they reside, what happens to us, the ecology uh, of, that we will live with in the future. We've got to be ahead of some of that and understand what it means for us. Poverty and persistent inequality is uh, driving. Um, I saw an article only this week about the pattern of use of urgent care in hospitals. Mo a large part of it explained by social inequality. Uh, we have got to focus hard on that. Um, preventable illnesses. It's inexcusable. We know things are preventable. Um, we have to change the conversation about um, how we do that with the people we serve. Um, there's new things, I mentioned genomics, precision medicine, infection, change, new infections, and all of that's emerging. We need to be part of that conversation. And increasingly, digital exclusion of being left behind, uh, I think, is a theme for us to think about. So if we focus on the social conditions that are driving the pattern of poor health, there'll be many people across the university here who've got something to offer. So what about the early years? What else do we need to think about in terms of creating... Uh, the best opportunity in those uh, first couple of years and even up to seven years. Um, being healthy in work. Uh, we're going to have to stay in work a long time. Um, so how do we make work um, the place where Don Berwick, the guru of healthcare improvement, said the one area he wished he'd paid more attention to over recent years in looking at quality improvement was creating joy at work. It matters. So how do we do that? Um, aging well, I've touched on. And then what are the components of a, a model of a 21st century healthcare system? <coughs> Housing. If we say we want to build our health system on keeping people at home, their choice in their own homes, then housing is part of our health system. So have we linked that up? Have we worked through how to do that? Connected, informed communities. Um, targeted services where they're most vulnerable. And um, inevitably working in a different way. But this is a global issue. We're not alone. So do we look out and learn from across the world and bring that knowledge back to Wales? How can we do that using the research infrastructure and the networks you have across the world? You know, our diet today, um, and this slightly complex uh, dotted colour picture, um, is tracking all the food production companies and they actually track back to about a dozen parent companies in the world. So how do we work on a global stage? to get our knowledge. And I was delighted to see Julie's presentation about the impact of the research you do. We are in a global conversation. Um, and again, I won't dwell on it. The research on meat, uh, the research on air pollution, again highlighted this week. New, th new science helping us understand the impacts. But what of the future then? Well, I I'll just conclude with um, Sir William Osler, famous physician. Um, and he said the best preparation uh, for tomorrow and all these challenges ahead of us is to do today's work really well. And uh, I wish you huge luck. I was also thinking um, about the, when you were talking about research excellence, that Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is a habit. So I wish you good, healthy habits. Thank you. Thank you.